Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this 13th day of October in the year of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2014 A.D. Thank you so much for watching this show today. My name is Wiley Drake. I have the privilege now to serve you for several years as the chairman of an organization called the Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. You have heard me talk about the history of the name and how we got the name. I'll not go into that today, but simply suffice it to say, if you would like more information on our purpose, on our goals, you can go to our website. Now, it is a very long URL, and all you young people that like the shorties and the abbreviations, just bear with this old man. The website is, and I say it slowly, Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. dot org. Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. dot org. That is our website. If you go up there, you will see a picture of me as the chairman. You'll also see a picture of my co chairman. Mm -hmm. My co-chairman is a man of great infamy. Uh, he is a pastor here in, in, in Southern California. Got my nose fixed, now my mouth don't work. Uh, but, anyway, <laughs> but anyway, Dr. Clyde Rivers is my co-chairman. Uh, he is a very infamous man, and I don't mean that negatively. He is very famous because of what he does and what he allows the Lord Jesus Christ to do through him as a pastor, as a husband, as a father, etc. But most of all, in reference to the Congressional Prayer Conference, he serves as my co-chairman, not an assistant, not an aide, but as my co-chairman. And I did that on purpose. Now, he is also uh, very famous in the fact that he is an American citizen, born and raised in this country, but he is a black man. And he is also the ambassador for the African country of Burundi. Now, some of you may find that to be a little bit interesting because he is not a native of Burundi, and yet he is the appointed, elected uh, ambassador for that African country of Burundi uh, by the president, President Pierre, and their government because President Pierre is indeed a brother in Christ. He is a brother to Dr. Clyde Rivers. He is a brother in that they both have dark skin. They both are Africans by descent. But they are brothers, not naturally, not biologically, but spiritually speaking. You see, the Bible says that Dr. Clyde Rivers, even though he's black, and Dr. Wiley Drake, even though he's white, that we are brothers in Christ because both of us are born again. And so is the president of Burundi. So that makes the two of them and me brothers in Christ. And over in Galatians, for example, to tell you a little bit more about what the Bible says, I want to be sure and quote the Bible correctly. So I'm going to go over there to, uh, 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 to that book in the Bible in the uh, real answer, and that is Galatians. Paul wrote a letter to the church at Galatia, and he said, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. You're one in Christ. Are you in Christ? I am. That makes us one. That makes Dr. Clyde Rivers and President Pierre down in Burundi uh, my brothers in the Lord because even though those two men are black and I'm white and uh, one is from another country and the other is from this country, we are one in Christ. One in Christ supersedes and overrides everything else that we are. And, uh, for example, I am a southerner. I'm from the South. I was born with South in my mouth. I was born in Magnolia, Arkansas, way down in the southwest corner in what people refer to as the 
Arklatex area. Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas. I was born there in southwest Arkansas, just a few miles from the Louisiana Gator Country and just a few miles from the Texas Rangers over in Texarkana. Now, I get back now to the fact that we are not only one in Christ, but we call our church the First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park and have for over 50 years. A couple of years ago, though, the Lord convicted me as pastor of this church that the Bible says that we are to honor the Shabbat, and we do, and I began to realize that I, as a Southern Baptist, had been taught that we're not to uh, acknowledge those things of the Old Testament anymore, and I found out that that was W-R-O-N-G, or as my mama used to say, that's wrong with a capital R. <laughs> But anyway, that was Mama. And, uh, but I want to read the last verse in the third chapter of the book of Galatians uh, to you as it responds and refers to Dr. Clyde Rivers, President Pierre in Burundi, and Pastor Wiley Drake. I gave you the website for the Congressional Prayer Conference. Now, in verse 29 it says, And, and, if, there's a big if there, and if you be in Christ, I'm in Christ, how about you? Dr. Clyde Rivers is in Christ. Pierre, the president of Burundi, is in Christ. All the other things we are, we are one in Christ. And he says, and if you be one in Christ, then, then, and therefore, you are Abraham's seed and heirs, and heirs according to the promise. Now, my Bible gives me a reference there uh, for that word heirs, and that's Romans chapter 8. Let's go back to uh, Romans chapter 8, if I can do it with all my big old fingers here and thumb through this and get back to, uh, get back to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8 is given me this in reference to the fact that it says we are heirs, we are heirs, and uh, when we say that it says Romans chapter 8 uh, verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also, that we may be also glorified together. And so, he goes on to say, and I reckon that the suffering <clears throat> of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am, this church is, judeo Christian, Christian by birth, we were born again, and heirs mm -hmm. of Abraham, making us a Judeo-Christian church. We have here at this building, where we have been housed now for more than 50 years, I've only been here 27 years, so I'm the new kid on the block, but... Uh, <clears throat> Over 50 years ago, the people of Southern California, some Southerners from Southern California, from Arkansas, Oklahoma, and those areas, and uh, Texas, came out here, and uh, they decided they wanted their own church out here in the country, out here in Buena Park, out near Walter Knott's Berry Stand along Highway 39. And so they came out here. And they started a church and a home, and then they got a building that they leased and rented, and then they bought a building. But during that time, people said, well, what's the name of your church? Mm -hmm. And they said, we want to call it the First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park. Well, they found out that, uh, oh, thank you for reminding me, Mr. Producer, to put Crusade Radio on. And uh, so I'm going to stop my story there just for a moment. And I'm going to add, that's, that's fine, no problem. I meant to do it and I forgot. We're going to go to uh, Crusade Radio because 
we broadcast on Crusade Radio as well, and uh, I'm going to bring that up, and that should ring now. And there it goes, ringy dingy, one ringy dingy, and that one ringy dingy, and it answered. And we're going to merge the call. So we now have the Congressional Prayer Conference call on the line and Crusade Radio. Welcome, Crusade Radio, to the Wiley Drake Show on the television network called Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. Now, I proceed ahead in talking about the history of this church. The people said, we want to be First Baptist Church of Buena Park. And they found out that there already was a First Baptist Church in Buena Park. And uh, it was not Southern Baptist, it was American Baptist, a very good group of folk. And they had a church and a building. And the folk that wanted to come out here knew with the Southern Baptist Convention, another Southern Baptist organization, another Baptist organization, they said, we don't want to be... Uh, you know, some churches would call themselves the Second Baptist or the Other Baptist. They didn't want to be that, so they wanted to be, and they adopted the name First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park. That is officially our title. Uh, that is a title in the records with the state. That's a title in the records with the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, Southern Baptist Convention is large, and we are very small, but we are a part of the large Southern Baptist Convention. We'll talk more about that later. But they decided to start a church, and they titled it or named it First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park, and it's been that way for years. And then a few years ago, when I realized that some of my professors had misled me in seminary and uh, told me that we should not celebrate the Sabbath anymore, and told me that all of the traditions of the Old Testament were not for the New Testament, that we were now a New Testament church. We are a New Testament church, but we're also an Old Testament church. I believe the Bible teaches, and I have practiced this, especially in the last few years, but I don't believe we ought to divide the Bible. I see no reason the scholars and the the people that wrote the Bible, that is, put it together. God wrote it. It's God's word. But those folk that put it together uh, called it the Old Testament, uh, and then the New Testament began in Matthew. Now, that is true, but for us to do away with the Old Testament, absolutely ridiculous. To do away with the Sabbath, to do away with Hanukkah, to do away with all of the traditions of the Old Testament and not use them in the New Testament is just wrong. Now, why do we call the week of the day, the first day of the week, according to the Bible, in the Old Testament as well as the New, was a day that later was called Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y. Now, they should not have named it the Sun Day because we are not sun worshipers. But there were enough of the sun worshipers around in leadership position that when they named the day, uh, particularly uh, the first day of the week, they named it Sunday, S-U-N. should have been S-O-N. Now, why do we have worship service and our fellowships on the first day of the week. Well, we do it because of some women. Now, I know you chauvinists not going to like that. But you see, uh, they met and had their fellowships and celebrations on Saturday. But after Jesus died and went in the grave, the ladies were doing their duty. It was their duty to have the bad part of life. <laughs> uh, the ladies' duties were not only to pick up the dirty socks and dirty sandals. The ladies' duties was not only to prepare the food and so forth, but one of the duties in the Old Testament, as well as in New Testament times, the duty of the women of the congregation. Their duty was when somebody died, 
they process the body. Now, we have morticians and mortuaries all for that today. But in those days, they didn't have that. That had not been developed yet. So, in the scenario of a person dying, when somebody died, they quit breathing, they laid them out, and then uh, they would very quickly, after they died, they would anoint them with oil, with frankincense, and myrrh. Now, those were very potent, very strong uh, ointments that they used to anoint the body. Now, they did two things. They used oil, frankincense, and myrrh to anoint the body. They anointed it with oil, and they anointed it with frankincense and myrrh for two reasons. Number one, for preservation, and number two, to stop the stink. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when your body quits breathing, when your heart quits beating, your body shuts down. The plant called the human body, that manufacturing plant that manufactures thoughts and everything else, that body shuts down. That means the bowels, the kidneys, the stomach, all of the body shuts down. Very quickly, very quickly, after death, the body begins to deteriorate and go back, as God said, to the dust. And in its deterioration, it gets smelly. Well, they had the practice of keeping the body around for a few days to celebrate the person's life and to mourn that person. And in order to prevent the body from stinking, they anointed it with oil, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, what's that got to do with Sunday? Well, it has a lot to do with it because the Bible says on the first day of the week, on Sunday morning, the ladies of the house doing their duty that they didn't like to do, but they had to do. Those ladies took the oil, the frankincense, and the myrrh, and they went down to the tomb where Jesus had been deposited, where his remains had been deposited. Now, they had been taught by Jesus, and they knew that Jesus was going to be resurrected one day, but they did not completely understand it because Jesus said, it's not just going to be one day. It's going to be, I'll be in the ground three days and three nights, and then I will come back to life. They didn't understand that. In fact, they didn't believe it. So that morning, on Sunday morning, he had already been dead three days, and after about the third day, the body begins to smell. So their duty was to go there to rub the body down from head to toe with oil, frankincense, and myrrh. And that would prevent the body from deteriorating so fast. It would also prevent the stench of death. Now, oil is a preservative. Oil was used by David, the shepherd, to anoint the head, and he used that example to teach us about how God preserves us and helps us he anointeth my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And so anointing is to preserve. So the ladies went down there, not the men, the ladies. The ladies went down there and said, wait a minute, where is our Lord's body? Where is our friend's body? And the angels and the people there said, he's not here. He has risen that was early on Sunday morning, early on Sunday morning. And so they said, wait a minute, what's going on here? Where's Jesus? He wasn't there. So they, I don't know if they took the oil with them, probably did, but they left there mm -hmm. and they went to the disciples and they began, in my opinion, this is my opinion only, they began what I call the first, Sunday service. The Bible says they begin to rejoice and to explain to those that did not see what they saw, they begin to rejoice and explain, He is risen. He is not in the grave. He is not dead. He is alive. And so, on that Sunday morning, the ladies, 
the ladies of the church started the first Sunday service. And we've been celebrating the same thing they celebrated. He is not here. He is risen. He is not dead. He's alive. And so whether it be music or preaching or fellowship or meeting and eating, whatever it is, we do all for the honor and the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we have been celebrating the first Lord's Day on Sunday ever since for 2014 years. Now, with that in mind, I can, I think, honestly say, even though it's my opinion, that the ladies of the church started the first worship services. The first worship of Jesus after his resurrection was set up by the women, not the men. Now, folks, I'm not a chauvinist, nor am I a feminist. Uh, I do believe in the order of things in the Bible, and we'll not get into that today. But I say all of this to say to you, we are a Judeo-Christian church. We do celebrate Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat, as best I can determine from the Bible, begins at sundown on Friday night and ends at sundown on Saturday night. Just this last week, we celebrated Shabbat Shalom, Friday night to Saturday night, and we'll do it again this week. Now, what's that all got to do with what we're talking about? Well, we've been worshiping Jesus now for 2014 years. But, unfortunately, we have had government leaders and church leaders that have led us down the wrong path. They are telling us that we cannot celebrate Shabbat they're telling us that we need to not involve politics and religion. Nothing could be farther from the teachings of the Word of God. And so, uh, this last Sunday, for example, at 7 uh, p.m. Uh, in Washington, we had a celebration that was simulcast all across the nation. We carried it right here on the Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C.'s television and radio network. Now, I did not ask the people that put that together for permission to do that. And if they don't like the fact that I did it, I will be more than happy to ask them for forgiveness. But I don't believe it was offensive. I believe it was simply a way that we could tell more people about what we called on this Lord's Day at 4 o'clock in the afternoon here at 7 o'clock at night in Washington, we declared, I pledge Sunday 2014. I pledge Sunday 2014. Now, I pledge Sunday 2014 was an effort on behalf of a lot of organizations. On October the 12th, this last Sunday, at 7 p.m. Washington, D.C. time, with more than 75% of Americans calling themselves Christians, we believed and do believe it is time for the church to rise up. One of my correspondents on this program is a dear, sweet sister in the Lord, uh, by the name of Robin. And Robin is a correspondent for the Wiley Drake Show. And she celebrates with us and calls on in every once in a while. Robin, if you're listening, call in and give us the Robin Report. But with 75% of Americans uh, themselves calling themselves Christians, the reason I brought up Robin is because Robin has founded an organization called We the People. You say, well, wait a minute. Uh, we already had that. We the people, yes. But Robin has an organization called We the People, and she added one word to it. We the People Rising. We the People Rising. 
And ladies and gentlemen, we are rising. We are rising to the battle. We have the numbers and we have a voice. If you and I are silent, we have no one to blame but ourselves for a godless America. Ladies and gentlemen, I repent. I confess. I have allowed the government to shut me up. But that's over. That's done. Back in 2008, on Sunday morning, I endorsed a political candidate by the name of Mike Huckabee. And I said from the pulpit of the church, on church letterhead, on this program, I personally endorse Mike Huckabee for President of the United States. Now there's one man that's an antichrist according to the Bible. His name is Barry Lynn. Now Barry Lynn would have you believe that he is a pastor. He uses the title reverend like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton do. But Al, but uh, Barry Lynn is not a pastor, never has been a pastor. But he sent a complaint about what I did to the Infernal Revenue Service. That's what my granddaddy called them, IRS. He said that's the Infernal Revenue Service. Well, you know that the alphabet soup on the hill in Washington, D.C., uh, the CIA, the FBI, the IRS, all those alphabetical soup people like to shorten it up so you don't know who they are. Well, I'm here to tell you IRS stands for, according to the original Wiley Drake, Infernal Revenue Service. They would tell you, no, Wiley's wrong. The original Wiley, the second Wiley, and even the third Wiley. My son, Wiley Jr., is actually the third Wiley. By the way, if you'd like to communicate with Wiley, with us, you can do it in several ways. One way, you remember quite often when I'm asked, what's your name? I say, Wiley, and they'll say, oh, you mean as in Roadrunner? <laughs> Everybody remembers a Roadrunner cartoon. So they say, your name's Wiley? Coyote? And I say yes. So we have an email now that's called Roadrunner and Wiley. Roadrunner and Wiley at gmail.com. Roadrunner and Wiley at gmail.com. So if you want to send us an email, go right ahead. My executive producer of the Wiley Drake Show, Jaime Guillen, will answer it with me or for me, uh, but we will answer your email. Now, I have other emails. Most of you know those. They're on the website and so forth. But Christianity is on the rise, ladies and gentlemen. Give you an example. In the year 2014, now that's down from 208, 208 is when I first preached the political sermon and pushed it in the face of the IRS. And now we have almost 2,000 preachers doing the same thing. By the way, I was not arrested. They brought paperwork against me, some 24 to 25 pages, telling me about what I could and could not do. By the way, I want to get back to Barry Lynn. He is anti-Christ. He is anti-Christ because he fought with me. He, uh, he, he touched God's anointed. And for that, I prayed imprecatory prayer against Barry Lynn and was criticized for it, but I'll just give you the words right out of God's word, not my words, but God's word. I'm going to give you the words uh, to the prayer uh, that I prayed against Antichrist Barry and uh, Barry Lynn. 
And it says here in the Bible, Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, not if, but when. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Now, folks, I prayed that against uh, Mr. Barry Lynn because he uh, asked the IRS to take away our 501c3 nonprofit tax exempt. Well, I don't care whether they take it away or not. I pay my taxes personally, and the church is tax exempt. Whether we have a 501c3 or not is really beside the point. And that law back in 1954 was a ruse. It wasn't even brought against, as was pointed out yesterday, against the church. It was brought up for some other reason. But the bottom line is, folks, the church does not answer to the government. It's that simple. And if your church is a 501c3 and you have answered to the government, you are placing a different master over your church. Jesus is Lord of the First Southern Baptist Church and Messianic Fellowship. Jesus is Lord, not the IRS, not the U.S. government. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a pro-government guy. I am so pro-government that when I was 17 years of age, I joined the United States Navy, and I went to Vietnam, and I killed people to keep this nation free. In fact, I made two trips to Vietnam to kill people, to fight for my country, and to fight for our freedom. So, folks, I'm not anti-government. Wasn't during the Vietnam War. Am not now. I'm very pro-government. In fact, the matter is... I was so pro-government, and the government was in such a toilet that back in 2008, I agreed with Dr. Alan Keyes to be his vice presidential candidate. And we ran for president and vice president. He is president, me is vice president. So I'm not anti-government. I left the Republican Party and signed up with the Independent Party and I ran for vice president with Dr. Alan Keyes when he was running for president. And in 2012, when we had an illegal alien running for president, when we had an illegal, unregistered, non-citizen running for president of the United States, I said that ought not be. And somebody said, well, if he don't run, who's going to run? And I said, well, I'm going to try to get Dr. Alan Keyes to run again. And Dr. Alan Keyes said, no, I'm not going to run again. And so in the inimitable, wily fashion, I sort of threatened Dr. Keyes and said, Dr. Keyes, if you don't run, I'll run. And Dr. King said, you have my blessings. So in 2012, I was candidate for president of the United States. Obviously didn't win. But I was a candidate. So I'm not anti-government, folks. But I am anti-church under the government. I believe, as Barry Lynn would say, he, by the way, he, he runs an organization called Americans for the Separation of Church and State. That's an oxymoron. You cannot be an American, a real American, and believe in the separation of church and state. I preach this on Sunday. The reason you can't is because the Mayflower Compact says this nation was founded for the glory of God, the advancement of the Christian faith, and the establishment of a righteous body politic. You cannot be an American and believe in separation of church and state. I'm sorry, you're just wrong. You can't do that. You're not an American if you believe in the separation of church and state. Now, I know some people are going to challenge me on that, but I don't give a rip. If you believe in separation of the church from the state, you're not a real American. 
nor are you a real Christian, in my opinion. But you can be saved and be wrong. But you can't be an American if you believe in the separation of church and state. You may have been born here. You may say you're an American, but you really aren't, ladies and gentlemen, if you believe in the separation of church and state. Barry Lynn believes in that, so he's not an American. Barry Lynn believes that this pastor was wrong, and Barry Lynn believes he's right. That makes him an antichrist. He is not the antichrist. I don't know who the antichrist is in Scripture. I have my suspicions. But I do not know who it is. But I do know this. The Bible says there'll be many that will come in my name. There'll be many antichrists, the Bible says. And Barry Lynn, Barry Lynn is an antichrist. He is against church and state. He is against Jesus Christ. He is against Jesus Christ's anointed licensed, ordained Southern Baptist minister, Wiley Drake, and that makes Barry Lynn an antichrist. And I pray every day in precatory prayer against Barry Lynn. And I'll leave the answer up to God. I'll let God do, I'm not going to try to push God to do anything, but I will pray every day. And Barry Lynn, in case you're wondering, you have laughingly and jokingly said, yeah, why did Drake pray imprecatory prayer? Well, yeah, you're right. You can laugh about it if you want to. You can laugh about it if you want to, but I pray imprecatory prayer every day against Barry Lynn and against the organization. I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, if you're employed by the Americans United for the separation of church and state, you get the heck out. You get the heck out. You're in dangerous territory because we, all over this world, not just in America, but all over the world, we pray in precatory prayer against Americans united for the separation of church and state and against their leader, Barry Lynn, and we do it every day. And you're in dangerous company when you're around that man that God may take out any day. Now, let's move on. On Sunday, we had I Pledge Sunday. IPledgeSunday.com. And by the way, there's another, uh, there's another website I want to give you. It's 123BOTE. I believe that will come up. Uh, let's see if that will come up for me. Here. We had I Pledge Sunday. There's also a website called 123vote.com, and that means you ought to vote. We ought to vote. We ought to carry on the tradition. Research says over 40% of us are not yet registered to vote. If you vote. Well, let me, let me get this where we can hear it. I'm going to, if I can get back to that. <coughs> And by the way, I want to talk to you about some other things now. It's already 38 minutes after the hour, and, and, uh, but we'll, um, we'll see what we can find out here. I know I'm going shotgun approach here, dealing with a lot of things, but ladies and gentlemen, America is rising up. And uh, I believe we need to do that. I believe we need to do that. Uh, tell you what let's do let's uh, let's see if this little thing will come up here for us I think it will we're gonna research says over 40% of us are not yet registered to vote if you forward this video to 10 friends a few of them may register for the first time
We need to remind Congress who they work for. We need to remind Congress who they work for. They work for you and they work for me. I pay their salary, so do you, when you pay your taxes. Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned, I am not anti-government. I am so for government that I ran for vice president. I am so for government that I ran for president. That's how government I am. But ladies and gentlemen, for the IRS, the Infernal Revenue Service, by the way, tomorrow night, tomorrow night on Tuesday, I'm going to the movie. I'm going to a movie. And uh, if you would like to find out more about the movie I'm going to go see, the title of the movie is Unfair, Exposing the IRS. Go to the website, unfairmovie.com, unfairmovie.com. Go to that website and check it out, and I would encourage you to do that. Uh, go to that website and check it out. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. U-N-F-A-I-R-M-O-V-I-E dot C-O-M. I thought they had a uh, thing here they were playing, but I don't see it. Unfair is the title of the movie. Unfair, exposing the IRS. I would encourage you to find out uh, where uh, the movie is playing. I think it's here local in my uh, in my local neighborhood, and I'm going to check. I'm going to find that out today. The Lord willing, I'm going to get a ticket today, and I'll be attending the uh, movie called Unfair, Exposing the IRS. You Let's see if we can pull up a trailer. Hello there, I'm John Oliver. Look, it's the middle of October, which across the nation... We're going to skip middle of October. <laughs> that sounded pretty good. Advertisement, yeah. Gadsden Films present this. I'm Craig Burton. I'm a political consultant, activist, and nationally syndicated radio talk show host. My foray into politics started at a young age. I was born into a Democrat family shortly after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Like everyone else, I'd seen the abuses of government. But working with figures like Alan Keyes, Ron Paul, and Newt Gingrich showed me that a majority of the problems in America can be traced back to the income tax. The agency targeted the Tea Party told to focus on organizations with, quote, political sounding names. When this latest IRS scandal broke, I knew something more than just talking about it had to be done. America stands at a crossroads. This has, in one seismic moment, shifted the burden of proof from the tinfoil beheaded to the government. For a hundred years, an ever growing leviathan of government has crept into every facet of our lives, our businesses, our homes, our churches, our charities, even our health care. It's just about too much power in Washington. The IRS's behavior was criminal. Why are the American people not demanding that we padlock their doors? This is not just a political issue. This is not just an economic issue. This is a moral issue. The government shuts you down and you fought back and now you've got an IRS office. 
I would never dream that I would have to fight for my economic freedom. Our founding fathers believed that government must protect the rights of the people. This is absolutely an overreach, and this is an outrage for all America. And that the government which governed least governed best. Is there any limit to the scope of where you folks can go? We're losing our, our rights as Americans. I am more concerned today than I was before. If we lose this premise, it will be lost forever. It is just so egregious. Something has to be done. If we don't do anything, I'm concerned for our future. The choice that lies before us is stark, simple, and direct. This is vaguely tyrannical behavior yes, by is. the American government. Will we remain a free people dedicated to the principles of self-government and self-determination? This should send a chill up your spine. Or will we cede the final ground in this conflict to those who by their every design seek not to be our representatives, but our masters. The movie, Unfair, Exposing the IRS. Find out where it's at in the theater, folks. You can go to unfairmovie.com. I will be, Lord willing, and I can get a ticket. Last minute. I will be in that movie on Tuesday night. It will only be shown one night, and I encourage you to be a part of it. Ladies and gentlemen, unfair exposing the IRS. I have now for several years gone to Washington, D.C. at least once a month. And one of my stops when I'm in Washington, D.C. once a month is outside a sign that says Internal Revenue Service Office Building. And I have gone and stood in the shadow of that building and prayed imprecatory prayer against the IRS and all of the demons. My granddaddy, Wiley Drake, was right on target when he called them the Infernal. Revenue Service. The IRS. Just think about it for a moment. If you're watching me on television or listening to me on radio and Crusade Radio, just think for a moment. When I use three letters and I say to you, IRS, what comes up? I guarantee you, if I were to put a monitor on your heart and on your blood pressure, your blood pressure would fluctuate. Your heart rate would change just by my mentioning IRS. And by the way, if you go to your mailbox this morning and you pull up the envelopes and you see one there from the light company, you'll think, oh, okay, another bill. The water company, oh, another bill. The gas company, another bill. But if you pull up an envelope that up in the upper right-hand corner, it says IRS, your heart rate will change. Your blood pressure will change. You will have a fear that will come over you that is absolutely unbelievable. You say, well, if you've done everything right, you won't. It doesn't matter. Everybody fears the IRS, except me. I'm not afraid of them. I am not afraid of them. You know why? Because they can do nothing to me that the Lord doesn't allow. They came after me with 24 pages of documents in 2008, and in 2009 they sent a little half-page paragraph that said, after due consideration of all of this investigation, we are dropping the case. They didn't say I was exonerated. They didn't say I was not guilty. They simply said they're dropping the case. Well, I dropped the case long before they ever did. You know where I dropped it? When I got those 24 pages of documents from the IRS, fear went over me. And I walked into the sanctuary and the synagogue of the First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park and Messianic Fellowship. And I got down on my knees and I laid that paperwork 
on the altar of Almighty God. I dropped the case. I dropped it at the feet of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The highest three-judge panel court in all the universe. So I dropped the case on God. The IRS decided they would drop it later as well. Not on God, but just drop it. Well, every year, several times a year, especially since 2008, I have associated myself with an organization originally that was called Alliance Defending Freedom. They have changed their name now. Their name is Alliance uh, Defending Freedom. <laughs> their name used to be the Alliance Defense Fund. Excuse me. They were called ADF, Alliance Defense Fund. They changed their name to uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom. And I have worked with them. I was the first one to receive their legal services in reference to the fight with the IRS. And I've been producing and preaching political sermons from the church, political sermons from this television and radio program. And I have begun to say I personally <coughs> endorse Canada. Let me say to you, if you're a candidate for city council, or as they used to say in the old days, if you're a candidate for dog catcher, <laughs> or whatever you're a candidate for, if you will pledge to honor the Bible in your position, I don't care whether it's dog catcher or president, but if you will say to me, Wiley, I will pledge to honor the Word of God. If you say that to God, you don't have to say it to me. You can if you want to. But if you say that to God, I'm saying to God, and I'm saying to a worldwide television and radio audience, I personally endorse that person. I was in a meeting the other night with a dear lady that's running for school board. Her initials are MJ. That's her name. MJ Knorr. Because she has said, I pledge to follow the Bible as a member of the school board, I endorse her and encourage you to vote for her. The same thing is true of Ed Royce, my congressman. I talked recently to Mike Huckabee my fellow brother in the Lord, my fellow Arkansas resident, and my fellow politician. In 2008, I personally endorsed him. And I think he's going to run again. But I want to say right now, on this day of the 13th day of October, I personally endorse Mike Huckabee for President of the United States. I hope he runs. And I would say to any of you politicians out there, two things I'll do for you. Number one, if you will tell me you pledge to follow the Bible, I will give you my personal endorsement. Whatever title I have, you're welcome to use, and I have a bunch of them. You're welcome to use any of those titles and say, this man endorses me personally, and I will. And I want you to know also this television and radio studio is available to you. I don't care what party you're running for. I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, Green Party, uh, Tea Party Party. I don't care. If you are a politician, you don't even have to take the pledge. You do, if you'd like, 
I'll ask you to. If you say no, that's okay too. But if you're a politician running for any office, this studio is open to you. We'll back the camera up, put you in a chair alongside of me here on my right-hand side. And if you're a liberal, I'll put you on the left-hand side. I don't care which side you sit on. But if you would like to come into this studio, I will give you the camera. And I will simply ask you one question. If you are running for a position, why should anyone vote for you? And then I'll let you talk to the audience and tell them why they should elect you as a Democrat, why they should elect you as a Republican, why they should elect you as an Independent, why they should elect you as dog catcher or President of the United States. I don't care. I'll let you have free airtime. I'm getting a lot of mailers in my mailbox. I'm seeing a lot of yard signs. I'm all for those. I bought and paid for a bunch of those when I ran. When I ran for city council in Buena Park, when I ran for vice president of the United States, when I ran for president of the United States, I bought and paid for a lot of those signs. So I'm not against signs. I'm not against flyers. I'm not against posters and brochures. Do those. Go on television. Pay for it. But if you want to come on this television program, all you have to do is call me on my phone and say, I want to come on. I will not back you in a corner. I will not try to tell you you ought to be something else than you are. But I will simply ask you a question. Who are you and what are you running for? And why should people vote for you? And I will let you run with that. Live on the Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C.'s television and radio network. By the way, in the last few minutes, I want to close out with giving another prayer request that's based on a press release. Mississippi stands on the verge of making history to be the first abortion free state in America. We're excited to help hasten that day, and I'm going to do my best. <clears throat> there is an operation going on that's going to begin Wednesday, October the 15th. It's already going on, but it'll have an official press conference on Wednesday, October the 15th. That's this week. That's two days from now. At the Jackson Women's Health Organization. Rusty Lee Thomas, my pastor, Dr. James David Manning, Michael Massey, and Bishop Otis Kenner will be holding a press conference there in Jackson at 12 noon. And I would encourage you to listen. We will be carrying it live right here on the Wiley Drake Show. Live from Washington, D.C., live from Buena Park, live from Jackson, Mississippi. And I have been assured by my pastor, James David Manning, that he will be my correspondent on that day and bring us a live report by telephone from Jackson, Mississippi. Please pray for them. Please be a part. And by the way, our prayer line will be open. Our prayer line will be open. And you too can call in. And pray with us and pray for us or give us your comments <clears throat> about the fact that Mississippi may be the first state that we can say hallelujah, another victory for Jesus and the good guys. Ladies and gentlemen, the theme for this program is do justice, love mercy, and walk with God. If you would like to call me, there are two phone numbers you can reach me on. And I'm going to give both those phone numbers as we close out. The first phone number is 202-747-4839. 202-747-4839.
The other phone number, 714-865-8132. Both those numbers are to my personal cell phone. They're on the screen. You can see them there. Call me anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I will be glad to respond to you. It's time for me to say good day and God bless, and I want to say this. This program is going to be called and titled America Rising. America Rising. Now, I'm going to rephrase that. I'm going to say Christian America Rising. Christian America Rising. Join us in the rise. Come on board. Get on the wagon. Good day and God bless. Mm -hmm.